I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false goods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be far too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For, the found, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mounting of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who, do, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their saviour. Such a generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the, this King of glory? The Lord almighty, he is the King of glory. Well, good morning. Good to see all lovely smiling faces this morning. Um, I love Psalm 24. Thanks for reading that. Was it Paul? Yeah, thanks for reading that, Paul. I love it because um, I was reading it this week and uh, every time I read it, there's something about um, the majesty of God that, uh, that just turns up, I think. And, um, <clears throat> and there's something about Jesus when he enters a room, that things change. Things dynamically change. And um, I want to speak today uh, about resurrection. I want to put talk, and I want to talk about it in the encounters that three people had <clears throat> in terms of resurrection. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a throat this morning. Unusual. Thank you. Oh, I'll be okay. Just, just a bit of a frog in the throat, I think. So what I want to say is, and this might seem a, a bit of a controversial uh, start or a heading, but I want to say that Jesus talks to dead people. Jesus talks to dead people. And um, so we're going to look at what happens to dead people when Jesus speaks to them. Thank you. That's great. Um, so we're going to look at Jairus' daughter. We're going to look at the widow of Nain's son. And we're going to look at Lazarus. Three people who Jesus spoke to when they were dead and brought back to life again. And I want to talk about them because... I just believe that God wants to say something to us that speaks to our situation, that speaks to our condition, that speaks to our very life, and in ways that changes things. It changes things. It means that actually religion is dead. Religion is not something that is alive. 
But relationship with Jesus is what brings life. I just want to say that because it's really important that we know the difference between what is religion and what is life. Jesus is life. He never came to talk about religion. He came to talk about life. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So, um, Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house. Jairus has come to him and said, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Will you come? Will you come and pray for her and heal her? And on the way, Jesus says, yes, I will come. And on the way, and there are crowds of people around him, and on the way, there is a woman who has, the Bible says, an issue of blood. You see it in Mark 5. Uh, chapter 5 and 21. And she has this issue of blood. Now, I want to talk about this woman for a moment because there's something marvellous. There's a marvellous connection between this woman and this little girl. And let me say that that connection is 12 years. This little girl was 12 years old. This woman had this issue of blood for 12 years. So it's probable that when this little girl was born, at the same time, this woman started to have this medical condition where she began to bleed from her body for 12 whole years. She went to the doctors. She spent all her money on the doctors. She had nothing left. And still she had this issue of blood. Now, the thing with this issue of blood for women in Jesus' time, there was a law, an Old Testament law, that said for women that when they had an issue of blood, they had to go into um, a period where they had to um, isolate themselves. They, They were unclean is how they were called, and they had to isolate themselves, normally for about seven days after uh, after they had uh, their period. The thing is, it also said that if this period, if this blood continued, they also would continue to have to be in isolation and that they would be unclean. Now, this woman had this issue of blood for 12 years which meant that she was unclean. She was considered unclean for all of that time. It means that she was an outcast. She couldn't mix with anybody. She couldn't go to synagogue. Anybody that she touched would become unclean. Anybody anywhere that she sat or or was in contact with, any clothes, anything, anything, meant that she was unclean. There was nowhere where she could go that would make her acceptable. This was her condition. This was her very real condition. She heard about Jesus. She heard that he could do something for her. Now for her, this was a real risk because she kind of almost hid herself from the rest of the people. Because if they knew that she had this issue of blood, she would have been thrust away from Jesus. So she took this risk of thinking, if I could just touch him, touch the edge of his garment, she would be clean. This was the desperation that she felt. So desperate. And she took a big risk because... What if she was wrong? What if this Jesus couldn't heal her? She'd have pushed through crowds. She'd have touched his cloak. Jesus would have become unclean. Everybody around her would have been unclean. There would have been pandemonium. 
she probably would have been taken to a place where they may well have stoned her to death because such was her condition. But she believed Jesus. She believed that, there was, that this man, Jesus, could heal her. So, it's really, I had a look on, 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 on Google and I looked at some images because I thought, I wonder what, because I'm a bit of a visual person really, I need to see something to begin to imagine it. And some of those images are where she is literally on her knees, crawling through the crowd to just touch the fringes of Jesus' clothes. And it's marvellous because some of the images is just of her hand just coming out and touching his cloak. And you see Jesus' feet and with the tassels from his robe just coming down and she touches it. And she's immediately healed. Immediately she is healed. And she feels it in her body. She feels healing go through her. And she knows she is healed. Jesus also knows that something, that power has gone from him. It goes from him. He feels it himself. And he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And there's crowds of people all around him. And he says, who touched me? And they even say to him, well, Jesus, there's so many people crowding around you. Have you ever been in a football match and there's people crowding around you? Go to a concert, crowding around you. And somebody says, somebody touch me. Well, you must be mad. There's so many people around you. Who, what do you mean? And Jesus said, power came out for me. And he looked for this woman. He looked for her. And he singles her out. And he finds her and she comes trembling and she says, the moment I touch your cloak, I was healed. And he says, daughter. Remember, she was an outcast. She had been an outcast. But he calls her daughter. Your faith has healed you. It's an amazing story. Because he restores this woman. He restores her dignity. He restores her in front of all the crowds who just caught, would have called her an outcast and, and called her unclean and says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Go in peace. And there's healing in her body and there's healing in her status. There's healing in her status before the people. And I believe that Jesus would say to us that not only will I heal you physically, I'll heal you emotionally as well. I'll come and touch that deepest part of you, that part of you that experiences loss, that part of you that experiences abandonment and sadness and grief. I, Jesus, say to you, I heal you, daughter, I heal you, my son, be at peace. Be at peace. Be at peace. So that's what happens on the way to Jairus' daughter. Some things happen when Jesus moves into a place. So this woman, 12 years with this sickness, now Jesus moves on to this 12-year-old girl. By the time he gets there, she's dead. And the people say, don't bother the teacher anymore. Don't bother the teacher anymore. She's dead. And there's wailing and there's crying and there's, they used to have these professional wailers that they used to hire for, uh, for when somebody died. And Jesus comes along into this mass of confusion and wailing and grieving. And he says, why? Why are you weeping? Why this commotion? 
She's not dead, she's asleep. And they laugh at him. So Jesus comes into the situation, he says, don't cry. He says to the parents, don't cry, don't cry. And um, he takes the parents in. He puts all the wailing people out. He takes in Peter, John, and James. And these three, these five people that he takes with him, they're people who believe that Jesus will do something. So he turns out the people who don't believe, who don't have faith, and he brings in the people that do. He brings in the people that do. And he speaks to the dead girl. He speaks to the dead girl. And he says, little girl, get up. And she gets up. She gets up. And he says, give her something to eat. See, the amazing thing is, she was alive. She became alive. You don't give food to dead people. It's obvious, isn't it? But you don't give food to dead people. And this changes the whole dynamic for this family and it would have changed the whole dynamic for the, the village that she was in because this little girl was alive. And Jesus says, I don't know quite what he meant by this, but he says, don't tell anybody about this. Don't tell anybody. I'm not quite sure that I could have, sa- could have said if Jesus had come into my house, healed my 12-year-old daughter, brought her back to life, that I couldn't go out into the streets and say, she's alive. She's alive. But there was something about the dynamic of that, of, that, of, that, uh, of that healing that changed everything. Second um, healing was when Jesus goes to Nain. He goes to this village called Nain. And he's going through the village and there's great sadness in this village as well. Because there's a widow there who's lost her son. Now this widow, probably, a widow in those days, they were probably about 60. To be called a widow was, A, of course, your husband had died. But she was probably about 60, something like that. So she was, you know, in her older years. And she had a son, one son. And this son was probably about 30, so he wasn't a young, young man, but, you know, he, he was, did everything. Provided for her, looked after her, did all those things. So when her son dies, she loses everything. There's no social security in those days. She has no family to look after. Maybe the villagers would have looked after her, but basically it meant that now she was on her own. She was on her own as a, as a person, as a, as a woman, and as an individual. And Jesus is moved with compassion when he sees this scene. And he goes there and he says, don't cry. Don't cry. Young man, get up. And the young man gets up. He's raised from the dead. And there's something so significant in the fact that Jesus comes into the situation and restores life. Um, and uh, it's, it's such a significant moment for, uh, for her, for the village, because Jesus has come. Jesus has changed the situation. Jesus is moving amongst them. And Jesus moves amongst us even today. Sorry, I don't mean to say even today because it seems an obvious thing. But I want to say that there is something about the presence of Jesus that changes things, changes situations. Um, Jesus wanted to make an impact because that's why he went there. That's why he stopped there. He wanted to make an impact on the widow, on this widow 
in a real positive way. And he himself was willing to risk ceremonial uncleanness to do so. Because again, he touches a dead body. He touches a dead body, which would have made him unclean, according to Mosaic law. Jesus was, uh, was willing to identify with what was unclean in order to make it clean. He was willing to identify with what was dead to make it alive. And this is what is so brilliant about that story. Um, so I want to just say, oh, oh, there's some notes there, sorry. I just wanted to say that Jesus wants to do life in you. So now we go on to Lazarus. Familiar story. We all know it. The thing with familiar stories is that they are as true and as powerful in its familiarity as when we first read it. I want to say that because sometimes we get really familiar uh, with things and they lose their, they lose their shine. Well, actually... Familiar stories in the Bible, they're always new. I say they're always new. They're always new to me, and they never lose their truth, and they never lose their power. So next time you read a really familiar passage in the Bible, and you say, oh, yeah, I've read this loads of time, I tell you, take a, mis- take a second to stop and see what God says in that, because the power and the truth of that is still new. It's still powerful. So... Jesus goes to see Lazarus because he's been told that Lazarus is also very sick and at the point of dying. And uh, Jesus hears this and he doesn't go. He takes two days. He takes two days before he says, right, we're going to see Lazarus because Lazarus is sick. Lazarus is he, could, he says Lazarus has gone to sleep and the disciples don't understand it. And they think, well, if he's asleep, he'll get better again. And da 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 da. But Jesus says, we're going to go there so the glory of God can be revealed. So Jesus, when he gets there, he meets with, with Martha and he says to Martha, don't cry. So in each of these stories, Jesus says, don't cry. When Jesus comes and speaks and he says, don't cry, you can know that there's resurrection coming. There's a resurrection about to happen when Jesus says, don't cry. You can know that something that was dead in you will come to life. Because he's that concerned about you. He's concerned about life. He's not concerned about what is dead because he wants to bring dead things to life. Things that you thought were dead. And yep, you know, some things have got to die. Absolutely got to. They do. But also there are things that God wants to bring back to life again. And I have to say to myself, God, will I believe that? Will I believe that there are things that I thought were dead, that I thought, you know, oh, it's all, you know, that's... It's never going to happen now. I've screwed up too many times. God can't possibly use me anymore. Well, actually, those are the things that God actually wants to bring back to life and say to you that they're not dead as far as I'm concerned. I want to bring it back to life. And you know what? Some people... Some people won't like what's happened to you. They would rather see you dead than alive. You know, those things that you say, right, I am taking hold of this again. There will be some people that say they don't like what you're doing. They don't like the position, the new position that you want to take. They would rather see you dead than alive. 
And I think it's really important, who will we believe in that situation? Will we believe God who wants me alive? Or will I, will I just submit to the opinions of people who would rather see me dead? Do you know what I'm saying in that? Do you understand kind of where I'm going with that? But in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God, you have new life. And in the kingdom, it doesn't matter if you're 12 or whether you're nine or whether you're 90. Dear Aileen, I wish she was here. Because <laughs> I would have said, it doesn't matter, Aileen, whether you're 12. Any of your children 12? No. Near? Nine. nine. It's close, isn't it? Close to nine. Close to 12. Nine, 12. Mm, it's all right. So... It doesn't matter whether you're nine or 90. God wants to bring life. So you get new resurrection. When Jesus tells the people to move the stone away from Lazarus' tomb, what's their reaction? Their reaction is, they, they say, oh, the smell will be dreadful. I can imagine. The smell will be de- dreadful. Absolutely true. He's been dead four days. The smell will be awful. But you see, Jesus is not bothered about the smell. Roll the stone away anyway. He's not bothered about the smell in your life, in my life. So, you know, it's so easy for us to say, God, if I roll that stone away, you're going to get the full smell of my life. There are things there that I don't really want to smell. I'd just rather keep it covered up. I don't want to go there. But Jesus says, I don't mind the smell. Let's deal with it. Let's bring healing to it. He says, roll the stone away. And it's really good. It's really good when Jesus does that. It's really good when Jesus says, you know, let's deal with that situation. You don't need to live with that anymore. You don't need to live with that shame anymore. You don't need to live with the disappointment anymore. You don't need to to hide it from me anymore. Because I want to deal with it. I want to heal you. I want to bring life to you. I want to take that un- what you think is unclean away from you. Those things that you feel terrible, guilty about. Jesus says, I want to bring healing right into that area. And what happens? What happens in that situation? When we ask, when we say to Jesus, yep, I'm rolling it away. Everything is open. Everything is laid bare before you, God. Have it all. Then we don't lay in the same place. We don't stay in the same place. You don't lay in your doubts anymore. You don't lay in your fears. You don't lay in your depression. just want to say that. that Jesus wants to deal with your depression. He wants to heal you of your depression. And people will say to you, you've got mental health problems. You can't do this. You can't do that. Jesus says, I'll heal you of that if you bring it to me. If you bring it to me. And people will pray for you. Don't lay in your discouragement. Don't sleep in your history And don't rest in your yesterday. That's really important for somebody to hear. For you not to sleep in your history and don't rest in your yesterday. And let that be what you stand in when Jesus tells you, don't cry. Don't worry. Come out. That becomes the new position we stand in. We're not spiritually disabled anymore. 
Praise God. And I speak this as much to me as I do as any one of you. I speak it to me as any one of you because that's the place I want to be in. That's the place I want to stand in. That's the confidence I want in Jesus that delivers me from all that dead stuff into a place where I live and move and have my very being. That's where I want to be. And you know what? It's not psychology. It's not therapy. Although that's okay. I believe in that, by the way. I think those things are really helpful. But I know that Jesus can go deeper than psychology and therapy. He can do the thing that brings those things that I think are dead back to life again. And it's not just me bringing some great motivational talk, although even that I think is okay, because you know it does get us going. But it's more than that. It's more than that. It does something that changes the position that you stand in because of what Jesus is doing. And there are always things that have to die in us. So he can say, rise up and come out of that place that held you dead. Those things will need to, to, to die. Because why we don't want to partner with things that are dead to us, that do us no good. Be real about that. Be real about that. Say, I don't want to partner with those things that only bring death to me. I want to partner with those things that bring life to me. So Lazarus comes out of the tomb and he's still wrapped up. And Jesus says, unwrap him. And you know what? We may come out of places where we're still wrapped up with stuff. But there are people, and good people, people that you trust, people you know, are willing to say to you, now that thing is not you. It's not you. And they'll rip those labels off. Those things where people have labeled you in the past. People who have said, oh, you're from the wrong end of the street. You're from the wrong end of town. You come from the wrong background. You come from the wrong ethnic group. You come from, you know, the wrong social strata. And they begin to say to you in old ways, oh, you're an outcast. You're unclean. You're not worthy. You're useless. All those labels... God never said. He never said that about you. God never said that you were useless. He never said you were a waste of space. He never said you were a failure. He says that you're the apple of my eye. He says you're the one I love. You're the one I care for. You're the one I will lift up. You're the one I give life to. He says those things about you. You're in a different place. When good people pray for you and take off the old labels, you're in a different place and you begin to stand up in that new life that he wants to bring you into. Because Jesus talks to dead people. His compassion looks beyond your pain into your tomorrows and into your future and it doesn't leave you where you were. As I said, it don't matter how old you are, how young you are, how middle-aged you are, how fit you are or unfit you are or whatever. Jesus won't leave you in the same place where you were before. So, if Jesus says, 
give us some food, give you some food, it's because you're not dead anymore. Jesus loves you. And dead people don't eat, but living people do. Thank you. Bless you.